I, I became an entrepreneur, um, I wouldn't say by design, but rather by the, the need to close a gap. Uh, I was working as a salesperson in, in an IT company and I was a bit worried about the way in which we were taking customer orders and, and delivering them. I thought that there was a big gap, you know, because typically in those days, this was in the early 80s, very few people had access to buy IT equipment from OEM partners. And our company will, will take a, an advance payment, sometimes 85%, from a customer and then we we'll deliver to the customer but I thought that what we could do in three months we're taking maybe eight months or nine months to deliver and IT being a high obsolescence product by the time the goods come they are already obsolete and well I felt that I was burning my goodwill because definitely we could do better especially when we have promised the customer that we are going to be uh, delivering within a certain time frame so I was there for four and a half years and times got very difficult, especially when the customers would call and say, Austin, I trusted you, I gave you my check, I gave you my business. And um, so I left on a friendly note to go and start a company of mine because I thought that I could do it better, apply the money for the business to the customer's order and deliver on time uh, and then endear myself to him further. So it was basically a gap that I saw. And I saw that the, the gap was an opportunity for me to fill that need. I convinced a few people to come with me. They made some contribution, initial contribution, initial seed capital. And then, like I said, I, and I thought I was able to, to do much better uh, in terms of the delivery than, than I was able to achieve in a former company. There were challenges along the line, but I think that the rest is history. What the unique approaches we have in my business are simple. One, that we want to hear the phrase in spite of, not because of. In other words, in spite of the challenges, we're able to make the results. Not because of the challenges, we're not able to achieve. We all know the challenges that we have here, and those challenges are also opportunities. And so we'd rather focus on the opportunity side and then deliver in spite of those challenges. That is the first thing. The second thing is that we teach everybody to achieve their full potential, that you can do it. So we have a mindset of I can do it. No matter how big the task is or the challenge, if you break it into small bits and if you put your mind to it, single-mindedly tackle it, you can do it. Another thing that we have is teach people how to learn. We don't teach people content, rather we teach them how to teach themselves. In a way, like when you get your first smartphone, nobody sits and teach you how to use it end to end. You probably are given a few tips on how to start to make a call and then you discover a lot of it on your own. It's called immersion. So by immersion, by experience, by learning and by intuition, we encourage everybody to reach their full potential and deliver uh, what we have jointly agreed. Without challenges, uh, there will be no mountains to climb. Why do people go and climb a mountain? I mean, if it was a flat surface, you would just walk along the flat surface and everybody else is walking along the flat surface. So there is nothing that challenges man than necessity to, to overcome. And those challenges are exactly what they are, necessities to overcome. So if you take the emerging countries, for instance, uh, people talk about the challenges in the emerging countries that probably will make them not to invest. But is these same challenges that makes their investment, uh, the return on investment very high. Uh, so for us, we see challenges as an opportunity for us to overcome. And we do not look at our success in a short time frame, not by quarters, not in a year. We look at our success over a longer period of time. Like the Japanese look 
typically are 10 years and 15 year plants, we do the same. The minimum we plan for is five years. So currently we have a five year program that we have put in place from 2010 to be the number one IT utility partner by 2015. And basically what we are saying is that with cloud computing, the whole industry is going to change. People are going to buy systems and, and, and services on a pay-as-you-use basis rather than buying a whole lot of kits and then after a while you have to probably tr trade them in or throw them away and buy a new kit. So this is a challenge that we have used to launch ourselves to become the number one IT utility company. What we have done is that we have developed a software for microfinance banks because these are the ones that touch the majority of, of the populace. And this software, which we call SaaS, which, which, which just means as a service, software as a service, we are launching it together with the number one telecom company uh, in Nigeria called MTN. What this does is that it enables the microfinance banks not to spend money to buy a kit or have a, a very big IT department, but at the same time have the ability to use um, IT to gain competitive advantage. This is just one of the things. We have another one which we call um, Enterprise ERP for small and medium enterprises. Basically what we do is to get them started from day one by putting them onto the system in the, uh, where we keep the back end in our data center. So they will use it for instance for their spare parts business, for their trading business and they will be more efficient and they don't have to incur that cost, but they still can get that competitive advantage. These are some of the things that we feel that will be the, the computing landscape of the future, and this is what we're uh, taking on as a challenge we'll conquer. People uh, in Computer Warehouse are self-inspired. They are self-inspired in the sense that we're very clear about the kind of archetype that we attract. What I believe we provide is the environment for them to flourish in their entrepreneurial mindset. So the people that will typically join our company are entrepreneurial minded people, people that want to make a difference, people that want to take advantage of an environment to, uh, to reach their full potential. What CWG does is to provide the environment. So typically when someone joins us, we put them through what we call the CWG Academy where they are going to have a three months theory and practical training. They will intern and then they see mentors everywhere around them and they want to be like these mentors. Yes, I'm probably the chief mentor as you will say, but there are also many other mentors that the, uh, the fresh intakes want to be like. And the fact that we were able to um, go out there and, and make an impact. If you take for instance in the banking sector, out of the 21 banks, 10 of them are using our core banking application called Finnacle, including First Bank, UBA, Stambik Bank. In fact, what is, uh, the industry says is that about 65% of all banking transactions are processed through the Finnacle core banking application, which means that we're processing 65% uh, of banking transactions. If you go into telecom, you will find that the back end that routes telecom uh, telephone calls or GSM calls for that matter are, are through complex systems of um, computers, big computers, enterprise systems. And we provide these for the major telecom companies. So chances are that 85% of your calls are routed through us. I mean, we partner with MTN, we partner with Etisalat. So let's say that all your calls which you are making with MTN or through Etisalat are passing through us. In the same way, if you look at the about 12,000 ATMs that have been installed, in Nigeria, um, CWG has installed and provides service and support for about 3,800, which is about uh, over a, a quarter of the ATMs that are in Nigeria that are supported by us with our partner Winconic Stop. So before people join us, they already know the exploits of the company and they are just joining to be uh, a part of this success story. I think for me, entrepreneurship is basically about volunteering. It's a bit like the army. 
entrepreneurs are, are, are not born. People ask, are they born? Uh, do they learn? Are leaders born? Do they learn? And I think that first and foremost, to be an entrepreneur, you have to volunteer. If you don't volunteer, you cannot be an entrepreneur. What has happened is that a lot of people, when they graduate, they join a company and, and they rise in the company. They are invested in the company. They are who they are because of the company. And they settle in that comfort zone and they don't probably try to see if they can stretch their branches a bit more to be more influential or to contribute more. Entrepreneurship uh, is about leaving your comfort zone. It's about taking calculated risk. Therefore, entrepreneurship to me is about fulfilling your passion. You should probably decide to do what you would do even if you are not paid. For instance, if you see a footballer that is on the bench, that footballer always wants to play, even though they are going to get the same amount as, as the person that is playing. But he wants to play because he has a passion to play. Usain Bolt has a passion to run. Mandela, Nelson Mandela the Great, was a freedom fighter. This is what he wanted to do, even if he was not being paid for it. And there are many like that. Once you reach your passion spot, then you flourish. So as an entrepreneur, the most important thing is, this is what I love doing. I will do it even if I'm not paid. I see a gap that I can fill with this my talent and I am going to go for it. And the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. Once you take the first step, everything falls into place. There may be rocks and bumps along the line, but I always believe that at the end of the day, if you prevail, if you continue to, to attempt to, to prevail, you will prevail. So basically, I have three things that I say that people that are going to be future entrepreneurs should have. The first one is weight power. The first one is way power. Way power means that you have the competence, you've learned something, you have a talent, be it football, be it writing, be it um, running a company. So that talent, you have it and you continue to improve upon it. That is your way power. That is the first W. The second one is your willpower. Your willpower is what enables you to go the extra mile, even when people say it will not work. Why are you wasting your time? This is an idea whose time has not come. So I remember that when I was leaving my lucrative job to go and start on my own, my father, my fiance, everybody was like, why are you uh, deceiving yourself? You have a good job, why not stick to it? You know, and when I started, it was rough, probably rougher than where I was working before, but I, I continue to tug at it, I continue to pull at it, and that is what every entrepreneur needs, that's staying power. So that is called willpower, that is your second W. The third one is weight power, and weight power basically is test of patience. Uh, entrepreneurship is not about what you achieve in a day. Entrepreneurship is what you achieve daily. If you look at many of the entrepreneurial companies that have become institutions, they are still achieving. Whether it's JP Morgan, which by the way is somebody's name, or Goldman Sachs, which is two people's names, or Oracle, or Google, or Apple. These are entrepreneurs that continually put themselves out to put out new products, new services, innovation. So let us not measure our success in short term and say, well, I've tried and it's not succeeding, so I'm going to leave it. I believe that an entrepreneur should have the staying power to go all the way and to go pick himself up, continue going and give a long range of time to judge whether he's been successful or not. And chances are that if you have patience, you see that what you have, the seed you have planted will grow to become a tree. What I consider to be my unique selling point or what I consider to be my major strength uh, is quite interesting is trust and integrity and when I went to start Computer Warehouse Group that was still my competitive advantage that hasn't changed the issue is people ask what kind of unique advantage is trust and integrity and you will find that when you're looking for a gap it, it differs from environment to environment. What was missing 
most in, bus in business environment in Nigeria then was trust and integrity. Perhaps it's still very, uh, it's still very relevant today. And so I felt that I will learn how to do something. I had a talent in doing something. I'm good with IT and, and with a business, managing a business. But the most critical thing was to deliver those services based on trust and integrity. It may be taken for granted in another place, but where we are today is a competitive advantage. Tomorrow it may be different, but at the time that I went into business and even today, the most important thing is to, to do what you say you will do, not less. If you can, you can do more. But if you say you are going to do 10, then do 10. If you say you are going to do 20, then do 20. Don't say you do 10 and then do 5. Don't say you do 10 and do 9. It's still short. So this is what I believe people really 